The behaviors inherent in hibernation, like going five weeks without sleep, or dropping to near freezing body temperatures would be potentially fatal to non-hibernating species like us. To find out how hibernators are able to do this, researchers turned their attention to those animals' genomes. So far, they've discovered that hibernation is controlled by genes that turn off and on in unique patterns throughout the year, fine-tuning the hibernator's physiology and behavior. For example, ground squirrel, bear and dwarf lemur studies have revealed that these animals are able to turn on the genes that control fat metabolism precisely when they need to use their fat stores as fuel to survive long periods of fasting. And the genes in question are present in all mammals, which means that researchers could study hibernating mammals to see how their unique control of physiology might help humans. Understanding how hibernators deal with reduced blood flow could lead to better treatments for protecting the brain during a stroke. Figuring out how these animals avoid muscle deterioration might improve the lives of bedridden patients. And studying how hibernating animals control their weight with ease could illuminate the relationship between metabolism and weight gain in humans. What is consciousness? Can an artificial machine really think? Does the mind just consist of neurons in the brain, or is there some intangible spark at its core? For many, these have been vital considerations for the future of artificial intelligence. But British computer scientist Alan Turing decided to disregard all these questions in favor of a much simpler one. Can a computer talk like a human? This question led to an idea for measuring artificial intelligence that would famously come to be known as the Turing test. In the 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, Turing proposed the following game. A human judge has a text conversation with unseen players and evaluates their responses. To pass the test, a computer must be able to replace one of the players without substantially changing the results. In other words, a computer would be considered intelligent if its conversation couldn't be easily distinguished from a human's. Turing predicted that by the year 2000, machines with 100 megabytes of memory would be able to easily pass his test. But he may have jumped the gun. Even though today's computers have far more memory than that, few have succeeded, and those that have done well focused more on finding clever ways to fool judges than using overwhelming computing power.
We all know the scene, Dorothy closes her eyes, and repeats the Good Witch's mantra, no coordinates exist like one's domicile, no coordinates exist like one's domicile, no coordinates exist like one's domicile. Only Dorothy doesn't say that. She says five one-syllable words, there's no place like home. Each a word you probably learned in your first year of speaking, each perfectly concise. It's not that L. Frank Baum didn't have a thesaurus. It's that in most cases zero words fail. When it comes to words, bigger isn't always better. Ten dollar words are rendered worthless if they're not understood. That's not to say every piece of literature should be written at a fourth grade reading level, but it is important to know your audience. If you're a novelist, your audience is probably expecting 300 pages of vivid descriptors. At the very least, they're expecting you won't use the same 50 words to fill those pages. But most of us don't have the luxury of a captive audience. We're competing against a whole world of distractions and we're fighting for space in an attention span that continues to shrink across generations. So get to the point already. The process of writing a book forces you to be curious. And no, contrary to popular belief, curiosity didn't kill the cat. In fact, it made the cat happier. Studies have shown that there is a link between curiosity and dopamine. So that means that people who are curious tend to have lower levels of anxiety, lower levels of depression and have a better overall psychological well-being. Furthermore, being curious helps expand our knowledge when we learn new things, explore new ideas and pursue knowledge, we end up having a better understanding of the world around us. When I was doing the research for my book, I, you know, looked at hundreds and hundreds of articles, books, blog posts, everything. And it was great because I ended up absorbing all this information, kind of like a sponge. And now I have a tiny little box back my brain filled with fun facts and tidbits of information that I can pull out, one, when a conversation gets dull, but two, to help users context when I'm learning new things and so you end up having a self-fulfilling cycle of knowledge where the more you learn, the more you can learn more. How do I learn to enjoy and embrace difficult things and have it be an integrated part of my life? So there are two things that really helped me do that. 
Number one is more of a mindset shift and it's more inner work. And number two is more of a practical, strategic thing that you do to yourself. Okay. So number one is to operate from an abundance mindset rather than a scarcity mindset. If you're constantly telling yourself, oh, I have to go read books to get smarter. Oh, I have to go read a book now. Obviously you're not gonna have a good time while you're doing it. But if you identify as somebody who enjoys reading books, it's something that you like doing, it's just a part of who you are, then you're way more likely to actually follow through with doing it. This next tip is a little bit more practical and a little less theoretical. And that is to utilize habit bunching. And that is when you pair an already existing habit that you are used to doing with one that you're trying to work on. So for instance, I'm a sucker for a great cup of coffee. I have one in the morning and one in the early afternoon. I really enjoy the taste of coffee and I look forward to it every single time. Do I have an addiction? Yes but I can leverage this filthy habit of mine into working on another habit. A great one to pair with a coffee addiction is reading. And that's exactly how I started reading more books. Every single morning next to my coffee maker, I placed the book that I wanted to read next to it so that when I made my coffee, I knew to pick up the book and I could only drink the coffee if I was reading the book the entire time I was drinking it. Done. Cell division is an intricate chemical dance that's part individual, part community driven. And in a neighborhood of 100 trillion cells, sometimes things go wrong. Maybe an individual cell's set of instructions, or DNA, gets a typo, what we call a mutation. Most of the time, the cell senses mistakes and shuts itself down, or the system detects a troublemaker and eliminates it. But, enough mutations can bypass the fail-safes, driving the cell to divide recklessly. That one rogue cell becomes two, then four, then eight. At every stage, the incorrect instructions are passed along to the cell's offspring. Weeks, months, or years after that one rogue cell transformed, you might see your doctor about a lump in your breast. Difficulty going to the bathroom could reveal a problem in your intestine, prostate, or bladder. Or, a routine blood test might count too many white cells or elevated liver enzymes. Your doctor delivers the bad news, it's cancer.
light up the world. After witnessing the violent rage shown by babies whenever deprived of an item they considered their own, Jean Piaget, a founding father of child psychology, observed something profound about human nature. Our sense of ownership emerges incredibly early. Why are we so clingy? There's a well-established phenomenon in psychology known as the endowment effect. Although feelings of ownership emerge early in life, culture also plays a part. For example, it was recently discovered that Hadza people of northern Tanzania who are isolated from modern culture don't exhibit the endowment effect. That's possibly because they live in an egalitarian society where almost everything is shared. At the other extreme, sometimes our attachment to our things can go too far. Part of the cause of hoarding disorder is an exaggerated sense of responsibility and protectiveness toward one's belongings. That's why people with this condition find it so difficult to throw anything away. screen as we know it today didn't exist 50,000 years ago. So how did our ancestors cope with this onslaught of UV? The key to survival lay in their own personal sunscreen manufactured beneath the skin, melanin. The type and amount of melanin in your skin determines whether you'll be more or less protected from the sun. This comes down to the skin's response as sunlight strikes it. When it's exposed to UV light, that triggers special light-sensitive receptors called rhodopsin, which stimulate the production of melanin to shield cells from damage. For light-skinned people, that extra melanin darkens their skin and produces a tan. Over the course of generations, humans living at the sun-saturated latitudes in Africa adapted to have a higher melanin production threshold and more eumelanin, giving skin a darker tone. This built-in sun shield helped protect him from melanoma likely making them evolutionarily fitter and capable of passing this useful trait on to new generations.
In the late 17th century, a medical student named Johannes Hofer noticed a strange illness affecting Swiss mercenaries serving abroad. Its symptoms, including fatigue, insomnia, irregular heartbeat, indigestion, and fever were so strong, the soldiers often had to be discharged. As Hofer discovered, the cause was not some physical disturbance, but an intense yearning for their mountain homeland. He dubbed the condition nostalgia, from the Greek, nostos, for homecoming and, algos, for pain or longing. At first, nostalgia was considered a particularly Swiss affliction. Some doctors proposed that the constant sound of cowbells in the Alps caused trauma to the eardrums and brain. Commanders even forbade their soldiers from singing traditional Swiss songs for fear that they'd lead to desertion or suicide. But as migration increased worldwide, nostalgia was observed in various groups. It turned out that anyone separated from their native place for a long time was vulnerable to nostalgia. And by the early 20th century, professionals no longer viewed it as a neurological disease, but as a mental condition similar to depression. Reliability and validity are two critical ideas for understanding standardized tests. To understand the difference between them, we can use the metaphor of two broken thermometers. An unreliable thermometer gives you a different reading each time you take your temperature, and the reliable but invalid thermometer is consistently 10 degrees too hot. Validity also depends on accurate interpretations of results. If people say results of a test mean something they don't, that test may have a validity problem. Just as we wouldn't expect a ruler to tell us how much an elephant weighs, or what it had for breakfast, we can't expect standardized tests alone to reliably tell us how smart someone is, how diplomats will handle a tough situation, or how brave a firefighter might turn out to be. So standardized tests may help us learn a little about a lot of people in a short time, but they usually can't tell us a lot about a single person. Many social scientists worry about test scores resulting in sweeping and often negative changes for test takers, sometimes with long-term life consequences. We can't blame the tests though. It's up to us to use the right tests for the right jobs, and to interpret results appropriately.